Namaste and welcome to Nepal Conversations. Nepal Conversation is a podcast series where we talk to scholars and researchers about the interesting work on various aspects of Nepal. We ask them to reflect on old and new problems, challenges and possibilities confronting contemporary Nepali society. The theme for Nepal Conversations second season is gender. Our guest today is Amy Lee Johnson, who is a political and environmental anthropologist of South Asia um, and who works in Nepal. She has a particular interest in the restructuring of states and environmental relations and is currently a research fellow at Northumbria University in the project Sojog Nepal, Preparedness and Planning for the Mountain Hazard and Risk Chain in Nepal. Her broader program of research focuses on the re-territorialization of the nation state and its future forms, which studies the context of local environmental relationships and imbricated national, regional, and international imaginations of state territoriality. She has received the American Anthropological Association's David M. Schneider Award in 2020 and the Britain Nepal Academic Council's PhD dissertation prize in 2021. Welcome to Nepal Conversations, Amy, and thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us. Um, Could we start with a brief introduction to your PhD study? What is it about and why were you interested in this topic? Sure. So thank you so much for having me, Kumud and Uma. It's wonderful to get this opportunity to speak about my work and interests. So my PhD really came together as a result of several years working and studying in Nepal first as a study abroad student with the Cornell Nepal study program in Kirtipur, and then later as a Fulbright student with, where I was based in Sindhu Palchok. And so during that time, Nepal was caught up in elections for the first constituent assembly and the work of creating a federal system of governance complete with these new administrative structures. And I became really fascinated by this process and interested in the ethnic movements for autonomous provinces and the ways in which attachments to and histories of land were being called upon to ground models for these provinces. So this interest carried over into what became two years of work with the Carter Center, most of which was based in the far western development region. And I had not visited the far west before 2010, but I was instantly drawn to the Terai landscape of Kailali and the interactions between indigenous Taru communities and settlers from the hills. This was probably because it reminded me a lot of my home region which is at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains in Northwest Georgia in the United States and its own settler history, which culminated in the displacement of thousands of Cherokees and other native peoples from their homeland in what's been known as the Trail of Tears. So when I applied for PhD programs in 2012, I wanted to continue exploring the process of creating federal provinces and other kinds of administrative units in relations to attachments to land and environmental and administrative histories but I wanted to do so in a way that represented how those histories, attachments, and imaginations surrounding territory, the nation state, and belonging were negotiated at an institutional level in the realm of formal politics like the Constituent Assembly, as well as in the everyday lives of Nepalis who are caught up in this historical moment. So the PhD study ultimately became about overlapping desires at the global and nation state level to reinvigorate the nation state institutionally and affectively. And I found that territory was this very strong entry into this interaction that was happening across scales and ideology of nation state design, because I found that it was the physical material geography of Nepal that was underscoring the most potent debates about the future of the Nepal state, be it in discussions about the criteria for forming provinces that were taking place between expatriate um, expatriate federalism experts, constitutional lawyers, and Nepali buddhijibi, or in the competing visions for federal provinces and autonomy articulated by indigenous and caste groups, which were especially strident in the far Western Terai region where I had spent so much of my time. So I spent my fieldwork between three main sites, uh, Kathmandu, where I got to know the history of administrative reorganization and the actors involved in informing decisions on federal design. I also worked in Dungadi in Kailali district, where I followed both the movement for an exclusively Terai based Taru province, Taruhat uh, or Taruwan, as well as the demand from hill peoples or Pahadis for a province they called Akunda Sudur Paschim, which would retain the hill to right integration of the existing far west development region. And finally, I stayed extensively in a rural municipality in the eastern part of Kailali, which was a site of earlier migrations from the hills to the Tri, 
And today is a mixed settlement of Taru groups um, from Dangora and Kathariya Taru um, lineages and hill persons. And from these vantages, I produced an ethnography of the state that was attentive to the intersecting pathways through which subjective relationships to land, people, and nation were entering into Nepal's newest state design. Thanks, Amy. Um, in one of your papers out of this thesis, you see that housework or cargo kam is an important part of the process of belonging to a home place. Can you explain more about why this is important and what you mean by this? Yeah, so um, this was featured in one of my dissertation chapters, and I'm really happy to get to discuss this in detail now. So gar kokam, um, or housework, was something that I was expected to contribute to in the household that I lived in throughout my dissertation fieldwork in Kailali. Um, I especially enjoyed going out to gather grass with women in the household and helping cook in the evenings. So doing this kind of work was a way for me to engage with women in the house and the surrounding community in a more relaxed way than going and doing, you know, interviews or just arriving and, ex and expecting people to talk to me. So, um, so that was one of the reasons why I was really drawn to, to housework. But it also helped me to begin to see how these routines were drawing women, many of whom were from outside the area originally and had moved into their husband's home after marriage. Um, how these routines were drawing them into place, um, easing them into a familiarity with people, topography, seasons, um, etc. So although I had not intended originally to be spending so much time with daughters-in-law, in fact, most of my closest confidants and participants in research became women in this position. And I think this may have occurred in part because of similarities in age. Um, a lot of the daughters-in-law that I spent time with were um, around 30 and our shared newness to the place and community. So when I had questions about who was related to who or why things were done a certain way, the daughters-in-law would patiently explain and I became very close to a few of the women who feature most heavily in the dissertation. Also, the ubiquitous uh, Garko Khan reminded me of some small comments I had read when I was considering fieldwork um, several years ago in these earlier studies of migration into the far west Terai. So one was from um, a report written in the 1960s by Charles McDougall. It's called Village and Household Economy in Far Western Nepal. And there he wrote briefly about how women were driving settlement into the Terai. He explained that conditions in the far Western hills were extremely challenging in the 1960s due to drought and famine, and women would spend a whole day going to collect water. The Terai obviously has plenty of water above and below ground, and the terrain was much easier to walk upon, making the completion of tasks go by much faster and, and hopefully more easily. So in another study from the 1970s by Dili Ram Dahal and colleagues called Land and Migration in Far Western Nepal, they also argued that it was, and I'll quote here, women who pushed the family hardest to break the relations with the hills, end quote. So presumably um, in his argument, or their argument, they did not wish to go back to the hardship of household labor they experienced in the hills and preferred to stay in the Terai where life was a little easier. And this was present also, this kind of um, comparison between hills and Terai was, was apparent in many of the migration narratives I took with Bahati men and women, where they discussed a lot about the Terai's qualities of improvement, Subida, and how this influenced decisions to move to Kailali. And they also talked about ananda, or blissfulness. And this quality of blissfulness or ananda was central to how the Terai was described in comparison to the hills at the time in the 1960s and 1980s, when most of those I spoke with had made their move to the region um, from places in the far western and midwestern hills. So in the end, Garkokam helped me approach two aspects of Basai Sarai, or resident shift, into Kailali um, that I was observing. One being the everyday experience of becoming attuned to a place world, right? Gaining familiarity with, with place and with people. And two, it helped me talk about the gender dimensions of settler history and emplacement, particularly for Bahadis. And this I found um, very fascinating given that a lot of the literature on migration speaks about women being left behind. And in the conversations I was having in Kailali, it was women who were pushing for the movement, I guess you would say. 
Thanks, Amy. That's fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask about something you said um, early on. Um, you said housework draws women into the police. Am I right? Can mm -hmm. you explain more by what you mean here? Absolutely. So by that, I was thinking more about the everyday routines that women especially are expected to do. Um, going out to get water or collect water, um, collect grass, walk the animals, like walk the baisi, right? Baisi Chilauni, and go to market to get um, supplies that aren't available in the household. All these different things that bring women out of the confines of the gar, right? Take them out of the four walls of the house and bring them out into wider interactions with the actual landscape that there's um, within and all the people and other um, entities that are present on that landscape. Thank you, Amy. That's, that's really fascinating. Could I also follow up a bit more on this paper? Um, mm -hmm. In this paper, you also say that the concept of belonging is uh, used too widely and too closely to identity and autochthony. You instead talk about the importance of ex experiential dimensions of uh, belonging. What do these concepts mean? That's a great question. So yes, the distinction I was trying to draw out concerned the exclusionary politics of place that can create a rigid boundary between insiders and outsiders. So in the rhetoric of the two dominant social political movements for provinces in the far west that I was following, this was often the meaning that was given to belonging, that it concerned a right to reside in a particular place. And for the Akhanda Sudarpashtim movement in particular, there was a lot of anxiety about their claims to be in the Terai and to hold the kinds of feelings they did for it. So scholars who study settler societies in Africa, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States have documented this tension among settlers. And in a study about white settlers in the Okavango Delta by Katie Grissier, she coined the term experiential autochthony as a way to talk about the process of feeling one's belonging to place, how that emerges over time. So autochthony is a term that is used similarly to indigenous or Adivasi in a lot of the literature, they're sort of interchangeable, but in the original Greek, it actually refers to a, a oneness between a land and a people, a sort of inseparable um, relationship between a land and a people. So what was interesting to me, however, in the case of the Far Western Tri, was that the language of autochthony was wholeheartedly eschewed or done away with by the Bahati activists of the Akhanda Sudar Pashtun movement. They saw themselves as autochthonous to the hills, not the Terai. They never made that claim that they were indigenous or autochthonous to the Terai region. So that term that's been picked up a lot in, in settler studies, experiential autochthony, ringed false for me. And also complicating this was that at the time there was also significant discourse about Taru belonging to the far Western Terai, given the histories of migration within Taru communities as well. So in this context, I found myself thinking more about the ways belonging in the sense of feeling familiarity, fondness and inclusion within a place or landscape can precede the political sense of claiming belonging to place and that kind of exclusionary politics. So my time in the Eastern part of Kailali, I think really helped me think more concretely about this tension surrounding belonging as an experience or a subjective quality and belonging as a right based on a politics of exclusion. So as I mentioned, um, the area that I lived in Eastern Kailali for most of my dissertation work had a mixed population of Pahadis. Um, they were mostly coming from Salyan, Gumi, Pyutan, Acham, and Baitari districts. And there was also a heavy presence of, of Tarus from Kataria and Dangora Taru um, groups. So all of the people I encountered would discuss mobility as a key dimension of their life experience, whether they were talking about everyday movement to accomplish tasks or shifts for marriage, employment, or education, or even the cycles of Basai Sarai that they had undergone in their own lifetime or within their family genealogy. So in the dissertation, I developed the term Basai Sarai or resident shift as a framing for this dialectic of movement and stasis and the process of coming into residence, or we might even say resonance, with place. 
Can you say more about Basai Sarai, Amy? Um, and if and how that might relate to what you're saying about belonging as a right versus belonging as an experience? Yes, um, happily. So Basai Sarai as a phenomenon is pretty common in the part of Kailali that I was working within. Um, a lot of people had moved more than once within their lifetime, recreating households and homes, um, recreating fields and farms and shops and just the all the accoutrements of life, basically. So if this was a process that people were familiar with moving and then establishing a site um, for their for their residents, I was interested in how this could be thought of in relation to what some of the philosophers of place, um, especially coming from phenomenology, think of as emplacement, as a basic criterion of perception and experience of the world. Um, so philosophers like Edward Casey, who I was uh, reading a lot throughout my dissertation in concert with um, reading my field notes about Basai Sarai, really emphasizes that rather than thinking about place as simply a location or a site, um, place is something that we are always within. Um, we can't escape the actuality of our physical location and the fact that that environment um, that surrounds us is informing how we interpret and see ourselves in the world. So I was thinking about how we're always and always, always and already in place. And even when we have to physically move from one location to another, we do that by walking through places. Um, we're not sort of picked up and, and dropped in a different place. There's a kind of gradual um, movement that happens um, in this process of Basai Sarai. So for me, that really helped me think more about this experiential dimension of, of belonging and attunement with different places in a way that was contrasted with some of the rhetoric that I was hearing in political speeches for these two movements that were really stridently claiming a belonging to the tribe that would allow them to govern it in a certain way, right? By creating a province that reflected their own attachments and relationships to the region. And in that language that was um, adopted in mostly in the Akanda movement, but also was heard in different parts of the Taruhat Taruwan movement, there was a sense that one group had a dominant right. So I can kind of go into a little detail perhaps and say that for the Akanda Sudra Pashtun movement, there was a lot of reference to history, of political history, of the way that different kingdoms in the hills had claims to the Terai before their incorporation um, or conquest into what became the modern state of Nepal. And based on those political claims, they had a right to remain in the Terai and a right to control it. And this was contrasted with the Taruhat Taruwan view, um, which was built from their own long histories of movement across the Terai region and their incorporation of the far western part of the Terai into a kind of Taru um, territoriality. So there were different ways that this was being um, articulated, but in both there was a slight use of exclusion or politics of exclusion. And I was interested in going beyond that, beyond the rhetoric, beyond the representation, and trying to see the everyday ways that um, both Pahati and Taru communities were making their way in the Terai. Thanks, Amy. Uh, you also talk about kinship in your study, and in one of your upcoming papers, you make an interesting point on the gendered making of Tharu Bahati relationship. Um, uh, and you refer to this relationship as a bhai bhai relationship, um, indicating an equal um, relationship, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a dadu bhai relationship, which indicates a hierarchical. Um, um, formation between the two groups. So how have ideas of brotherly kinship shaped politics in the period of uh, political transformation in Nepal? Yes, yeah, so this argument is related to the way kinship idioms um, were entering into and structuring politics and political imagination during the time of state restructuring and political transformation. So I'm sure um, most listeners are familiar with Bai Bai, um, which can be translated as younger brother, younger brother. So this was a phrase that was uttered a lot in inter-ethnic contexts between men and Kailali, particularly in political gatherings and in political speeches. 
So for example, when I first um, lived in the far west during the time of the first constituent assembly, the Akhanda Sudra Pashtim or United Far West Movement had stenciled a slogan um, onto the east-west highway from Ataria to Mahindranagar. And the slogan was Taru Pahari Bhai Bhai, Bikandan Kari Bhai Bhai, which can be uh, translated as um, Taru Pahari are brothers, Bhai Bhai to separatists. So during my dissertation fieldwork in 2016, uh, to 2018, I was really surprised to see that that stenciled slogan was faded, but still there on the highways. It was sort of haunting the present with this memory of the high politics of the first constituent assembly, which um, led to a, a lot of in, uh, violent conflicts between uh, Tarus and, and Bahadis in a way that preceded what became known as the Tikapur incident. So, at that time, I took Bai Bai as a framing device for the kinds of political relationships that Akunda Sudarpustum advocates expected to come out of their interactions uh, with Taru men. So between Taru and Bahari men, what kinds of possibilities were there um, for social and political relationships? It interested me because in its tone, it implies this equality or closeness or an intimacy in reference to brotherly kin relations. But on second glance, it's really not the kind of kinship that reflects biology, meaning that the hierarchy of siblings reflected in Daji or older brother and by younger brother is being subverted for this kind of an ideal sibling equality. And this interested me a lot, um, one for its presupposition that Taru and Fahadis are in a relationship akin to that between siblings, and second, for its assertion that their relationship was that between equals. So from all my time with Taru Hot Taruwan activists and with Tarus in Kailali, I knew this was just not the case, that there are many, many, many types of inequalities that Tarus experience um, today, even with the legal safeguards of the constitution. So why then was it advantageous to use this phrasing and framing bye-bye? So in the paper you mentioned, I discuss how kinship idioms like Bye Bye gave an appearance of social equality to the Akanda movement. In other words, that the language of fraternity and equality subdued the effects of their practices and also was a pejorative way to chastise those who would work against their brother, in quotes, to demand a separation from the hills um, and their own province in the Tarai. So I actually had a conversation with an individual who claimed to have helped come up with that slogan that I saw stenciled on the highway, Taru Bahari Bai Bai Bikandankari Bai Bai. And his explanation likewise linked together kin and region, upholding the idea of unity or akanda in ethnic and geographic alliances. And I found this to be um, a very succinct way to get at both the environmental place, um, regional aspects of these two competing movements and the larger politics of federalism in Nepal and the social interactions between different caste and ethnic groups that were also key to um, the development of social inclusion in the constitution and that conversation. Thanks Amy for sharing that really fascinating insight on the complexities of uh, the idiom of Bhai Bhai, which on one hand, um, uh, emphasizes the possibility of social equality, but also could bring in its own uh, difficulties. You also mentioned that it comes uh, at the cost of reinforcing notions of group endogamy. What do you mean by this? And maybe we can begin by uh, what group endogamy is. Yes, absolutely. So this is uh, closely tied to the preceding question, but is wider in scope beyond just the dynamics of the far western Terai. So Group of endogamy is the notion that the boundaries between insider and outsider can be maintained through biological reproduction, that you can marry or reproduce within your own group. It's a practice that mirrors some of what I was talking about earlier regarding the exclusive politics of place because it insists on maintaining and valorizing group purity. So at an extreme end, um, you can look at the Maluki Ain, which a lot of people have looked at, right? and find how so much of that 
legal document or legal text is about governing the boundaries of social groups. And the Malukiite also included elaborate stipulations for how to contend with incidents where those boundaries between groups were crossed, right? Creating new caste groups to accommodate the children of, of, these, of these unions. So as I mentioned um, earlier, Bai Bai carries with it this allure of brotherhood, but not one that's based on biological kinship. And it has some interesting uh, resonance, I think, with the idea of mit or mitini. So mit launi historically allowed for alliance building across social groups in Nepal. And an anthropologist um, from Japan, Okada, writing in 1957, tells us that mit is a system, and I'll quote him here, whereby two individuals, usually unrelated men of the same or different caste, regard each other as brothers, as true of the sons of one father, after participating in an initial ritual, end quote. So the act of becoming ritual brothers in through a mid um, formalized feelings of mutual affection and strengthened bonds that could be relied upon for economic assistance. But there was a cost associated with formalizing these, these relationships. Um, neither participant could or their kin could marry into the family of their myth or matini. So in the case of myth, creating brotherhood across ethnic and caste differences, formally established ties of affection and support between individuals and their families, but did not encourage homosocial intimacy or reproductive relationships. But we know um, implicitly from our experiences, um, and I think my ethnography in Taru and Pahati communities in Kailali illustrates this, that this idealistic formalization of equal but separate groups is, is very much a fiction, that there are many kinds of social intimacies taking place between people of different ethnic and caste identities. So in the paper, I follow three examples of this. So the first one that I um, elaborate on is the example of a Pahati woman um, from one caste marrying another Pahati of a different caste who comes from a different district and the challenges um, associated with that union, even when it has the appearance of a lot of um, group endogamy kind of characteristics. So another example that I explore is that of a Taru woman who becomes married to a Bowen man and their child and sort of the outcome of that um, crossing of, of supposed crossing of boundaries. And then the last episode, that I go into detail in, in the paper is a bit more ambivalent and concerns an episode where a Taru woman who has a reputation for, um, for seduction and she has a lot of power around, around her sexuality um, creates a situation for the seduction of a, of a Bowen man, but she also puts me into that situation. And by the end of the evening, it becomes very unclear um, just who is trying to make this, this cross-boundary connection. So it was through these examples that I wanted to show how hybridity and inter interaction across groups occurs in this kind of mundane realm of everyday life, um, not just in political alliances um, that were being conjured up by the use of slogans like bye-bye. Thanks, Amy. Um, you just talked about the mundane, so we'll move on to um, the next paper that you have, where you talk about the everyday task of women cutting grass, and you say how the enticements of the mundane and the everyday in anthropological knowledge production is important. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your methods and what are the challenges and opportunities of studying the mundane? Oh, I like this question a lot, um, this question about methods. So. So as an ethnographer, I'm committed to participant observation as a method. Um, participant observation implies sort of a long-term uh, situational knowledge that's built out of becoming part of people's lives and also stepping back and taking the time to observe interactions and what's, what's happening. So when Malinowski, who should not be quoted all that often, but I think it's important to recognize that he, he laid out this vision of an ideal fieldwork context. And one of the things that he wrote about um, in regards to this was how the ethnographer should be in, attentive to imponderabilia. So those things that cannot be precisely measured or evaluated, such as the tone of everyday life. 
And so I became sort of committed to figuring out ways to access that imponderabilia. So participant observation as a method is, is really good for that because unlike interviews where you go in with a, with a set of questions that's already been somewhat predetermined, although there are different strategies around interviewing, participating and just being in places with people and allowing yourself to just absorb um, gives you a way to over time catch on to the kinds of social um, cues and relationships that are not really commented upon frequently. So I was more interested in that. So I had a lot of opportunity for studying the mundane um, when I was in the Eastern part of Kailali for, like I was mentioning for the majority of my field work. We already talked a little bit about uh, grass cutting when I was um, talking earlier about housework. But in addition to cutting, cutting grass, I also um, was involved in walking the animals by Si Chilaune, just kind of slowly, slowly, slowly moving alongside the, the Baisi as it went out to, to eat its grass in the evening. Um, but I also did really mundane things like just walk around <laughs> to people's uh, to people's houses. I, I th thought about that as, as something that's very mundane and often uncommented upon. And another strategy that I used um, was cycling. So for women, especially in the part of Kailali that I was in, women were not allowed to have a motorcycle. It was extremely rare. I think I saw one woman driving a motorcycle the time I was there. So all the women were cycling places. So we would go in these little like um, caravans of bicycles to visit people and kind of that cycling and the interactions that happened along the roadway. That was another sort of mundane I also, and I haven't talked about this very much because the, the papers I shared didn't necessarily um, speak about this aspect of my work, but I also spent a lot of time in government offices. So in Kailali district, um, staying in, in the Palika office that was newly created and before that in the VDC office and spending a lot of time with bureaucrats uh, watching the routine of their work, which if in, anyone who's spent a lot of time in bureaucratic offices anywhere in the world, uh, not just in Nepal, know that there's a lot of downtime and it can get really uh, dull in those spaces. And so I would spend my days um, when I was in government offices, just observing the things that bureaucrats and officials, uh, elected officials would do during this downtime between their appointments, how they spent their days and just kind of charting and making um, observations about, about that. There are also challenges, as you mentioned, for studying the mundane. One is that it can get dull, right? It can get boring. So I had to be very diligent about writing my notes daily. I would also try to take time during the day to make um, sketch notes to myself, just reminding me about what I did, because sometimes the days could just bleed into one another um, and get a little bit monotonous. So I tried to keep track in my notes of things that, I, that stood out to me in my day. If I felt that my attention was slipping, um, and that I was becoming kind of sloppy in the notes that I was taking or just um, disinterested, I would try to shake things up a little bit. So there's a tension between the mundane and, um, and excitement. So I would go to a new place or strike up a conversation with someone I didn't know to, to try to access something different. And at extreme times, I would just go to a different site. So as I talked about earlier, there were three main places where I did my work, one in Eastern Kailali, one in Dungari, and then in Kathmandu. So if I felt things were getting too repetitious and I was um, not paying attention as well anymore, I would just change the field site altogether I was in and sort of start over. Thank you, Amy. Um, in this paper, you also present some fascinating accounts of the hidden transgressions of women in the village in Nepal, all within the context of grass cutting. You focus on the mundane, but also you're talking about the sensational. Can you say a bit more about this contrast? Yeah, so this was the first paper I wrote when I returned from fieldwork in 2018, and it did not fully make its way into the dissertation. So I'm extremely happy that I get the chance to talk about it here uh, because I actually really like this paper a lot and I hope to get it published soon. Um, so yes, amidst the mundane task, there are lots of sensational things happening. And this might be surprising uh, because when we talk about routines and the mundane, it's precisely that they, they're routinized, uh, boring activities. 
But in fact, the tasks of housework, because they're routine and regular, can actually contain a lot of possibilities within them. And what I mean by that is for women that I was spending time with, especially daughters-in-law, they're under a lot of surveillance in their households. And going out to do something like cutting grass, even though on the surface it seems like complete drudgery, and a lot of women did not like having to do this, especially in the heat, right? And that is a lot of the year in Kailali. But when they would go out to do things like cut grass, it gave them time and space to do things that they like. So they could often arrange for um, things like grass cutting to be done with friends. So they could spend time with their friends, catching up, gossiping, and so on. But also they would use their time outside of their households doing this kind of uh, work to sneak cigarettes um, and other substances, to call and text boyfriends, and in general, just to have a sense of, of freedom. So I was really interested in this kind of dimension of what all was going on within this seemingly very boring household work. And the paper that, um, that you're referring to goes into detail about these different practices that are enabled when women can kind of work under the veneer of the mundane um, to have this kind of space of freedom to engage in activities and with people that they truly want to spend time being with and things that they want to spend time doing. Thanks, Amy. I really enjoyed reading that paper. Um, but all through your other papers as well, you also put an emphasis on multi-species relationships mm -hmm. like other ecofeminists might do. Um, and it is fascinating how you describe farm animals like Kumari and Lal Singh as grass-eating household members. Uh, you even give a pseudonym to the buffalo, Kumari. Can you tell us why this is important for you? Oh, I'm, I really was pleased with this question. So my definition of the household was quite encompassing in my work. I basically thought about the household as incorporating anyone who contributed to its reproduction. So I couldn't imagine that household without the animals um, that were so present during my time in, in Kailali. So there was um, this, this dog who had made the Basai Sarai <laughs> with the family, um, who was there present every day to greet us when we woke up. Um, we served her food and she kept us entertained throughout the day. Um, she also would have an annual litter of puppies that then brought this joy to the household that everyone was kind of involved with. In the household too, there were cats coming in and out. Um, I also adopted cats and kept them with me while I was in the field and they stayed um, to help eat the mice and do all of the things that cats like to do. <laughs> and then of course, um, there was the bicy that you mentioned and, and also the, the goat that people would care for very, very um, dearly throughout the year, very concerned about what the, what the goat was eating and whether the goat was sleeping well and all these other things before um, going through the, the ritual once a year of, of cutting the, the goat and, and sharing the goat, right, to, to eat. So all of these different animals, um, these kind of domesticated animals were really present um, at the, every single day in the lives of people that I was spending time with in Eastern Kailali, in that particular household especially. Um, and I wanted to find a way to really take that into account and not just dismiss, dismiss them as sort of either peripheral um, or just for economic um, purposes, but thought about them as social actors who were part of the family in a real sense, especially when it came to um, the dog, the cats, um, the bicey, and, and the goat. So I have been influenced a lot in the program that I was doing my PhD research in at Yale University, the combined degree program in environmental um, anthropology between the school of what was called the School of Forestry and the Department of Anthropology. And so we had a lot of conversations about um, human animal relations. And so from an early time of my training, I was more attuned to the prospects of sociality happening amongst um, animals or across animals and, and humans. And when I went to Kailali, I could see this happening in front of me and I wanted a way to represent that in the paper. 
um, and in my work. And so applying pseudonyms was a way of sort of equalizing the respect that I was giving to the animals who were who contributed so much to my time in Kailali and to the people who, who did as well. Thank you, Amy. Um, we are now coming to the end of our conversation. Uh, but before we go, could you tell us a bit more about your present or your future projects? Uh, what are you working on now? Yeah, so I'm currently a research fellow with the Department of Geography and Environmental Sciences at Northumbria University in the United Kingdom. And I'm working as part of a project called Sajag Nepal, Preparedness and Planning for the Mountain Hazard and Risk Chain in Nepal. And for me, this is a really exciting project um, because it's bringing together natural and social scientists from all around the world, um, from Nepal, the UK, Canada, and New Zealand. And we're coming together to think about how people are living in mountain environments in the context of both physical and environmental changes and social political transformation. So for example, in, in the Nepal context, the unrolling of federalism or federalism's implementation, the creation of new provinces and local units and new structures of governance with the earthquake of 2015 and the subsequent um, episodes of landslides and um, heavy monsoon rainfall and, and flooding. So how people are navigating these overlapping and concurrent kinds of transformations or shifts in their immediate um, localities, both environmental and social political. And one of the reasons that I'm really excited um, about this work and I'm so happy to be part of the Sajag Nepal project and being at Northumbria universities is that I get to work with scholars and early career researchers at Social Science Baja and other international institutions and contribute to ethnographic fieldwork in different palikas across Nepal, which is for me the most, um, the most fun and exciting part about research is the um, ethnographic fieldwork. So at the same time, I should say that I'm uh, working with Northumbria and the Sajag Nepal project. I'm also making time to get out all of the papers that were mentioned today and make them available for the public and for people to interact with and, and, um, and discuss and debate. So very excited to be getting some publications out in the next year, hopefully um, in early 2022. And finally, um, the big goal over the next couple of years is to put together a book proposal and manuscript that's based on the dissertation project that I shared a lot about today. So a lot on my plate, um, but all of it really um, productive and fruitful and exciting. And um, I'm so glad I got to share so much with you both today um, and everyone today about what I've been working on and what I plan to, to be working on in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amy. It was wonderful speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your research with us. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. Thanks, Amy.